Okay, great. Um, thank you for uh, another 40 minutes, yeah? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you for having me and um, flying me all the way from <laughs> England so I can claim the farthest traveler to the uh, conference, I think, <laughs> maybe. Um, yes, so, definitely, yeah. yes. Okay, definitely, yes. <laughs> all right. Um, so I come from uh, University of York and we have a group there at the Center for Health Economics. Uh, I'm within a smaller team uh, where we focus on global health. Um, we also have teams that work on uh, health econometrics uh, and health evaluation. Uh, some of you may have visited or done some courses or, or seen some of the work. But we, we refer to it as CHE, uh, the Center for Health Economics. And we have uh, a big picture of CHE Guevara in front that Mark Stolfer put up on Christmas as a joke. And on um, so, uh, but I'm talking today about equity and economic evaluation. Um, and in low middle income countries because that's uh, my focus. And I'm gonna be talking a bit about a framework that we call distributional cost effectiveness analysis that's with um, uh, several other people. It's led by uh, Tony Collier and uh, Richard Clipson and Susan Griffin um, and several others. And we're all kind of working a bit in incorporating equity and inequality in the economic, value, economic valuation frameworks uh, that are used. So uh, it's just, Tell you what I'm going to talk about, but I'll just talk about it instead. Um, so I don't think we need to go too much more. Everyone, I think, mean, uh, after this uh, conference so far, knows all the different problems that we're talking about with equity um, or, or inequality. Uh, we tend to think of um, equity as some sort of fairness or social justice based inequality. So uh, we try to build that into some of the frameworks and happy to talk a bit about how that uh, works within the framework of, of the distributional cost effectiveness analysis. Um, but just the basic concept that there are persisting social gradients, we've seen how um, some of those manifest. Uh, within the global health uh, kind of field, um, and global health specifically thinking about middle income countries, um, there's the, you know, the WHO commissions on social determinants of health. Um, there's certainly the kind of broader goal setting agenda um, around UHC or universal health coverage, um, and also the the so Sustainable Development Goals, which you may know about, uh, which came about uh, recently, 17 Goals of Sustainable Development, which followed the Millennium Development Goals, which have, you know, these kind of broader global health governance constructs around uh, this SDG, so the Sustainable Development Goals, have a big one on, on inequality as a cross-cutting effort, but within the equity realm, it's also about reducing inequities in maternal mortality, child mortality, um, uh, incidence of prevalence of HIV AIDS and other kind of large uh, global health problems. Um, but you know, it also brings it to um, play anything that really relates to inequity and kind of social justice. There's, there's issues of poverty, um, climate change that are all built into these goals with equity and inequality kind of uh, intermingling throughout. So um, within my last bit on the SDGs is just that there's a health specific goal and within that, there's one on universal health coverage that actually does um, the only measure of universal health coverage that's actually an indicator, which are these sub-goal indicators, is around financial risk protection um, and the incidence of catastrophic uh, health expenditure, um, which is a bit problematic in terms of measurement in a lot of countries. So, um, and finally, yeah, uh, just presenting that there's you know, the persistent health inequalities in the United States, certainly also in the United Kingdom, uh, recent uh, UN Commission actually detailed a lot of the child poverty in the United Kingdom and came to a large shock to a lot of people. So, like I mentioned, I have this framework called DCEA, Distributional Cost Effectiveness Analysis. If you haven't noticed, we kind of have an acronym problem, I think, in uh, global health, um, but I'll try to keep them at a minimum. But the basic cost effectiveness setup um, is that there's scarce resources, there's decisions that need to be made and that indeed are made um, all the time, and there's some way um, perhaps of uh, ranking or prioritizing these decisions. And in cost effectiveness, uh, it's about maximizing overall health. So we have some sort of cost per benefit, um, if that's a favorable cost per benefit, so it's a, a relatively efficient uh, intervention or, or investment, um, then that's going to maximize the overall health um, given the budget constraint that we're facing. Um, I'll, so, so I'm just, I guess part of the talk is to give you some of the more recent thinking that we're at in York. And a lot of that is coming around through the communication of cost effectiveness um, to non-UK audiences. So 
one thing we'd say now is resources <coughs> and not um, budgets, um, because the concept of budgets is, doesn't transfer as well in a lot of places. So thinking of resources, we actually have a, a so Carl Claxton has a swear jar. So every time we say certain words that he doesn't like, he makes us put a pound or, you know, in the jar. Um, they're not worth as much these days. Um, um, so the um, so this is our our you know, broader decision uh, context that we're in. Um, within traditional cost effectiveness analysis, uh, it's common to use um, average level costs and, and effects. Um, there certainly is some recommendation to look within equity. If you look at like the Cheers guidelines or um, these other kind of broader um, uh, checklists for what to include in your cost effectiveness analysis. Um, but it's been part of several systematic reviews and, and other opportunities. <coughs> really, people don't include uh, equity analysis, maybe a, some nod towards subgroup analysis within cost effectiveness, but we don't look at distributional um, issues. Um, to start thinking a bit about uh, the equity frameworks that, that can be incorporated, um, it's interesting to think that cost effectiveness itself is not an equity free concept. So there is a, a you know, talk about how do you weight different outcomes. Uh, here talking about quality adjusted uh, light years um, could easily be any other generic measure of health or, or whatever measure of health you're actually looking at in your evaluation problem. Um, but the fact that if you weight quality as a quality for one person versus another person in the same way, that there's some sort of uh, utilitar utilitarian or quasi-utilitarian, because we're working with qualities and not uh, welfare, um, uh, proponent where we're just trying to maximize the, the total level of health um, given the, the cost effectiveness um, question. So, yeah, to think of it as a duty of beneficence or sort of public provision by policymakers where we assume that they're also interested in uh, maximizing total health, which is not necessarily the case. Um, but this is just one, one equity concept, this quasi-utilitarian equity concept, but one that would try to be conscious of that it exists even within our cost effectiveness uh, analysis. So uh, there, are, there are lots of ways of thinking about weighting, and I'll go through one of them. And those that were familiar with how the DALI concepts of disability adjusted life years were measured, there's quite a big debate when they were first measured about age weighting, um, et cetera. So the next kind of um, just real quick conceptual issue that I want to get into is thinking about how equity has been used in cost effectiveness analysis and in the literature or in practice. Um, and there's one level that's kind of fits more into the social determinants of health and population health um, perspective, and that's the one I'm going to focus on. And that's thinking of these kind of uh, lifetime perspectives in terms of uh, health gain throughout the lifetime or uh, the gap in, in the health that you would have achieved if you, um, if you wouldn't have received an intervention or would have received an intervention. Um, but there is another equity strain in the literature um, that's about severity of illness that has come up a little bit. And I think we haven't uh, really broken that out. Um, uh, at least I haven't seen, perhaps in, uh, in honor was talking about different like levels of, of risk, of health risk, and then also different levels of socioeconomic groups. So kind of a bit of a blending of some of the patient level severity equity concepts versus the um, population level or social group um, uh, inequalities, but something to keep in mind. Um, but and that, that literature has led to things such as end of life weight, uh, orphan conditions. Uh, the NHS uses a different decision threshold um, for uh, orphan drugs, um, and that's around the severity of illness concepts um, as well as other things. Um, the notion of opportunity costs is um, important to the economic valuation framework as it's been conceived in by several of the economists at York and, and others. So this is just a health production function. So the public expenditure on health um, recently kind of revised this thinking to you know, it's all expenditure on health. It's the, the resource constraint rather than just whether or not it's public or private. But um, understanding that in the production function, the change in the, um, in, in the cost per change in health actually represents what you might be foregoing in the system with each investment. So it's just a simple notion of health displacement or displacement within a system during dis during investment or <coughs> disinvestment that motivates an opportunity cost. And what that really, um, you know, I think some of York economists are known for obsessing about opportunity costs, but really it's just a way of netting out um, another cost in the system that you're incurring. Um, 
and I'll talk a bit about, about how that relates to um, equity. So this is just the basic setup. Um, again, for most of you that have worked in cost effectiveness, this is going to be fairly familiar. So if we uh, now move from our production function to kind of a, let's just call it a uh, health cost and health um, to be applied. So the cost on the y-axis, health on the x-axis, and some notion of a threshold value. Um, here, you know, we propose that health opportunity cost is your threshold value because that represents the um, opportunity cost of the next best investment that you're giving up. Um, and looking at uh, that intervention y, which falls below our, um, our threshold value, uh, then gives us a net positive health um, if our net health is a health gain minus the health displaced. So a positive value of net health um, would be, uh, you know, it's going to fall under essentially, for those that know more about ICERs, so incremental cost effectiveness ratio, the slope parameter is lower than the slope of the, uh, the threshold value that we're using. So, and again, very similarly, but in the opposite uh, in intervention X, that's uh, less cost effective, is giving us less health um, per unit of expenditure, and so we're going to have um, a negative net health gain, which is just the uh, health gain minus the health displaced. So this is a concept just so that um, you can understand how I'm talking about cost effectiveness in terms of net health. So positive net health is cost effective, negative net health is not cost effective, just because we're doing this um, subtraction based on the, the decision threshold. Um, so one kind of innovation that we like about distributional cost effectiveness analysis is bringing in um, distributional opportunity costs that um, different types of expenditure actually have different opportunity costs based on um, uh, disadvantaged groups or social disadvantage. Um, and it kind of gives you uh, a bit of a tool for thinking about um, your cost effectiveness results when you break them out into distribution. So uh, if we have some intervention that's giving us, let's just say, you know, in terms of the gross health benefit, some sort of uh, pro-poor, um, from the poorest to the richest, some sort of pro-poor distribution seems like a good uh, investment um, just on those equity terms. And then the drop in terms of the, what we're giving up in opportunity costs to give us net health, then also, if we assume it's equal across groups, then gives us another pro-poor uh, good in terms of equity uh, conclusion. If we do think that now these parameters differ, so again, it's just the slope parameter here, um, that we're talking about. But if now this does differ by socioeconomic group, um, that the drop is now larger in the course so of the poor able to benefit more from some level of expenditure or public expenditure budget, um, then they're now uh, incurring a larger opportunity cost. Uh, then we actually see that the net health benefit, once opportunity costs are netted out, uh, is now pro rich. So um, it's no longer on equity grounds looking like positive uh, or uh, an attractive uh, investment. So in the UK, there's a, so uh, Richard Cookson, uh, James Lepko, and a few others have actually taken UK data and kind of worked within some of these uh, public economics and public finance um, literature. Some uh, like Nora Lustig, Tulane does quite a bit of this, the you know, public finance and um, the, the marginal incidence of public expenditure by socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, a lot of progress in um, Latin America. Uh, but this is doing the same thing in the UK, um, looking at whether or not the opportunity cost uh, length of, of NHS expenditure is different by socioeconomic status group. So here it's by um, male, female, and socioeconomic group. But generally showing that indeed there is a larger um, opportunity cost because of marginal utilization within the groups, uh, socioeconomic groups, um, in the poorest groups um, that we see. So um, this is a general finding from the UK, and, and uh, James and, and Richard test this quite a bit to see how robust it is to the different types of adjustments of the of the opportunity cost. And again, so I mean, they take the perspective um, that they're adjusting the uh, you know the, the Claxton at all thirteen thousand pounds per dollar estimate of opportunity cost, and show what this looks like for different investments. Um, in global health um, settings or low-income country settings, we're trying to find ways of, of doing similar things. There's um, these type of study that called a benefit incidence analysis or marginal benefit incidence analysis that uh, you might uh, know about or you might not know about. Um, but this is one in um, Malawi that was looking at the um, benefit incidence in terms of 
what benefits are occurring to different social groups of health expenditure. Um, and you can see that in hospital settings, so the different people are seeing in the UK, the actual, the more advantaged groups on the top here are seeing 25% of the resources being spent on them and 14% of the lowest groups. So in terms of hospitals, we see the wealthier groups being um, spent on um, in health centers then, which are more outpatient and um, outpatient care in Mali, you see a bit more of an uh, increase in um, the poor groups or more disadvantaged groups using the, the outpatient centers, uh, which is a pattern you tend to see in, in low income countries that uh, well up, which tend to go to have higher hospital utilization um, for any type of care that's needed, um, and tend to uh, pay, pay more for that. So um, this was a benefit incidence uh, actually only of public expenditure, uh, which is worth thinking about because in the UK we have a very convenient situation where uh, pretty much any adjustment can be done with, um, with public expenditure, whereas in Malawi you do have a large out-of-pocket um, payments uh, for health care as well. Um, and it's one thing that I think we try to bring in into some of these applications of, of some of the, the frameworks on economic evaluation, but maybe not um, as well as we should. So, the general DCEA um, thinking now, once we bring into the, these concepts of uh, net impacts and, and opportunity costs, are that we're trying to say, okay, uh, if something is cost effective, so we have our costs and effects now collapse onto a single axis of net health that I was explaining, and we also can come up with a measure of equity impact, and then it's a simple you know, two by two, win-win, lose-lose, so uh, something either dominates, or there might be a trade-off, and that's where um, there might be some interesting cases uh, to look at in terms of what the trade-offs are in terms of equity and efficiency, or equity and cost-effectiveness. Um, you could just stop here, right? So one thing that that some some groups in the UK, groups at uh, Liverpool, are are doing is taking um, plots like this, uh, coming up with what's the appropriate equity measure on the x-axis, again, not so straightforward to standardize equity measurement, but if you pick a measure and, and run with it, you can start plotting where interventions fall on these lines, and there's some uh, nice papers on, um, there's one on cardiovascular disease in BMJ that looks at uh, different prevention versus treatment options and where they fall on these lines. You find that a lot of the prevention options end up being um, pro-poor, uh, sorry, pro-rich, as we call it, due to the, the nature of the, the agency nature of the intervention that you need to actually seek out the, the preventive measure, um, things that are more targeted and, and have some equity measure built into them. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, equity objective in terms of targeting poor groups um, will clearly be uh, more equity improving, so, um, but then the cost effectiveness may suffer because you have to uh, perhaps pay a bit more for that targeting. So there's some interesting ways of looking at um, just this. Um, but we move a bit beyond it, and what we do is move beyond this to understand these trade-offs in terms of a social welfare function. Um, so this comes with uh, work with uh, Richard and also with uh, Eric Schockart and um, Mark Flaubert, um and looking at social welfare functions uh, to understand the distributions of health and how uh, we might trade off between equity and efficiency uh, in uh, cost effectiveness analysis. So, um, sorry if it's hard to read this, but I'm also colorblind, so I don't know if anyone else can read it. So, there's a, um, we use a, actually an Atkinson social welfare function where this is the formula and you have this uh, epsilon risk aversion parameter. Um, that's a measure of relative equity uh, versus a Colm uh, measure of absolute uh, inequality, uh, not equity, but um, which has this alpha measure, which is the same thing, it's just an inequality aversion. Um, parameter. So this is just saying, given that you know what your inequality aversion parameter uh, is, we know how we trade off some measure of equally distributed uh, health um, across different groups. And so this comes from a lot of the, uh, the uh, income inequality literature um, in building out social welfare functions. Um, I'll talk a bit about this on the next slide, this, this notion of a utilitarian versus a Rawlsian um, uh, approach to it. So a, a different figure now, uh, two different groups and a, uh, a frontier uh, type analysis. So this is kind of just a foreshortened graph here, but um, showing the equal health line that we have an advantage group um, on the x-axis and a, a, a disadvantage group on, on the y-axis. So we're always gonna be having more health than the advantage group as a stylized you know, 
fact, pretty much, or just a fact. Um, so we're probably never going to reach full egalitarianism uh, in society. It's just kind of reality. Um, but if we have our level of health, our baseline health, and we know that investment can push that um, that health now to uh, closer to the health frontier, or also decide between two different groups, then uh, we can actually build this in as a social welfare function framework. So um, starting with the baseline health, we can maximize health by reaching the tangent on the frontier. And that's, um, we call this, okay, so another point caveat is that we use the kind of um, historical ethicist uh, framework. Um, it's being criticized a bit by real ethicists that, um, that you know, say that Bentham wasn't necessarily a full utilitarian and he had a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things. So we're using this in a very stylized way. This is a, a Bentham utilitarian. Uh, let's just assume that Bentham said we need to maximize the overall uh, welfare or health. So it's just kind of a, it's a bit um, tongue in cheek. But, um, but we could also go for Maximin, which is uh, the Rawls approach that we need to invest more uh, in those that are the worst off or, or put all of our uh, resources in those that are worst off. So um, we reach as far as we can onto the production frontier into those uh, that are more disadvantaged. Um, but we're, we're giving up health um, in terms of the maximum amount of health. So there's some sort of trade off. So where, do, where does that leave us? And it leaves our framework in the Atkinson um, uh, in between utilitarianism and maximin. Uh, where we actually have some level of inequality aversion that we might weight these uh, these investments in how their ability to reduce health inequalities or inequities and their level of actually improving overall health. So, in the UK, there's been some discrete choice experiments by um, the York Group um, and some others to look at what is this inequality aversion parameter. Are people more benthamite? Are they Rawlsian? Are they um, some level of, uh, of Atkinson? Um, so they. So we found that really, you know, not too many people are are Benthamite. Um, only about two percent of people. Um, again, this was a discrete choice experiment. I don't have the slides for it um, here, but uh, if you could imagine showing slides of different groups and their levels of health and the actual uh, inequalities in the health, and you say, is this better than an investment that levels health down overall versus reducing inequality. So these kind of trade-offs that people are answering. Um, you know, and uh, not too many people are maxing in either, which is getting all to the to the worst off group. Um, a few people think everyone should be equal. Um, and the majority of people want to are, are say that there's some level where they stop making these trade-offs, where they stop leveling down uh, the trade-offs. Um, but you know, outside of the pro-rich and health maximizers, at least all three of these groups, 84%, think there's some level where we're actually reducing overall health is a good thing in terms of improving uh, equity and health inequality. So it's just a sign, that, and this has been fairly consistent. We've tested uh, across different populations in the UK. We do it every year with our uh, master's students, um, and they always come out fairly weighted, fairly retarded. Um What do these numbers look like? Um, you know, in these surveys, people are quite a bit more inequality averse than you, than you would tend to think, than, or at least than we would tend to think. Uh, it's okay, these reversion parameters are just whatever numbers, but this is actually giving you a sense of what that looks like. They, they actually value health to the worse off groups seven, six to seven times more than they value health um, to the least worse off um, groups. So uh, it's quite a large inequality aversion within this experimental setting. Okay. Um, so this is our, our DCEA approach. So it's the standard uh, cost effectiveness, health impacts, uh, net by opportunity cost gives uh, net health. Uh, but we're building in these distributions um, and by equity relevant groups, which, um, which is something in and of itself um, in terms of scoping, what are the equity relevant uh, groups? Uh, you could look at socioeconomic status, but you might well think that other groups are, uh, have levels of disadvantage or unfairness. Um, and then we build in baseline health inequality into this. Um, and that's an, another important point, I think, in, in this framework, is that uh, the baseline health inequality is the current level of health inequality in the population. Um, and what we do, we need that actually to build up the social welfare um, framework, the social welfare function framework. Um, and what we find is that 
a lot of, and actually in reviewing the literature, a lot of equity and economic evaluation really focuses on the health impact in terms of the distributional impact without building it back into overall uh, health inequality. I mean, essentially what that's doing is that, uh, in some sense, I, I think that the health impacts just on net are kind of overstating the overall impacts. And when you build it into um, a baseline health inequality, it actually really shows you that you're not really moving the needle too much on small interventions. <coughs> um, so it kind of, I guess it, for us, it makes it a bit more real in terms of what you're actually gaining um, in health inequality. Um, but certainly the impacts are, are important in, uh, in and of themselves. So uh, yeah, so this is just kind of a diagrammatic of the whole thing put together um, so you can see um, what that looks like. Um, so there's been several examples in the UK where distributional cost effectiveness analysis has been done. Uh, we benefit from fairly good data in the UK. Certainly people complain about data even in the UK, um, but from where I'm working mainly, uh, it tends to be even worse. Uh, using, we use small area, uh, small area geographic estimations of, uh, you know, it's called index of multiple deprivation. Um, that's what we use, it's, so it's like small census tracts. Um, so that's what we use for our socioeconomic status uh, measurement. Um, but it, it came about that we wanted to try to apply this method and see what were some of the challenges and, and ways of thinking about it um, in global health settings. So um, we started to use an example of a rotavirus introduction uh, program in Ethiopia. So this came about because um, well, some links with some Ethiopian researchers that we have that were involved in another acronymic approach called ECEA that some of you may have heard. So that's developed by um, Dean Jameson and Stefan Berge um, in Washington and Harvard. Uh, and what they're really doing is looking at this kind of non-social welfare function approach, just kind of playing out a dashboard approach of, of the distributions of health impacts, um, but also building in financial risk protection, um, which is a quite a, a nice uh, addition to, to the standard approach. Um, yeah, and there's no, it's, I think it's a bit unfortunate that we have ECEA and DCEA, and now no one really knows what other <laughs> CEAs to do. There's also SCEA, Social Cost Effectiveness Analysis. So I, I'm, hopefully at some point, the acronyms can kind of start working themselves out and get less confused. Um, but in any sense, we can just think of it in general terms that a DCEA is building in uh, distributional concerns in the same way that ECEA is. Um, but I will say that financial risk protection is a bit um, a bigger component of this ECEA. So back to rotavirus in Ethiopia. Um, we had a uh, comparison of a, a do-nothing intervention to introducing rotavirus, and we also uh, had a scenario of a targeted um, outreach program for reaching rural areas. Um, we started out essentially with a, a baseline distribution um, by uh, socioeconomic status using uh, several surveys in the country. Um, we had some clear data gaps in terms of the uh, health outcomes and how they were distributed um, within the population. Um, we used some work for some, um, some Ethiopian researchers working with uh, Bergen, University of Bergen in Norway, and developed this, uh, some, some inequality measures of life expectancy uh, in Ethiopia. I think I put this up here with the distribution in the UK just because it brings up a good equity point um, in that you know, within Ethiopia, from the lowest quintile to the highest quintile, 47, this is, um, sorry, healthy life expectancy. Uh, it's 47.5 uh, for the lowest, the poorest group, 60 for the highest group. Um, but thinking about relative versus absolute inequalities, you actually see that the, the richest group in Ethiopia, just on this quintile entry, uh, doesn't even meet the, the poorest group um, in the UK. So that's clearly uh, some sort of absolute um, or you know some sort of level of uh, vertical and, um, and horizontal differences in equity. Um, it's just, I think, an interesting point to bring up. Um, but we're working just within um, Ethiopia. So put this into the rotavirus model and um, had our distributions of, of costs, distributions of, uh, uh, of impact. Uh, we actually benefited from a recent Gates initiative to uh, invest more in vaccine costing data uh, in developing countries in the EPIC studies, um, EPIC studies. So they, um, uh, that gave us quite a bit of information on the targeting costs into rural communities. Um, so what you see here, so compared to the do nothing, this is the, um, the main vaccine program that we were looking at, um, it doesn't come as cost effective in terms of uh, two of the threshold values we were using. 
Um, and it's cost effective in terms of these other threshold values we're using. So where do these threshold values come from? There's another strand of work going on in York to kind of counter the uh, traditional, the, the, what's called the WHO recommendation, although WHO has reneged on that, uh, that recommendation, of one to three times GDP per capita um, as from the Commission of Macroeconomics and Health as the cost effectiveness decision threshold to be used. Um, what's happening now uh, is that we're trying to triangulate what uh, health opportunity cost thresholds would look like in other settings. So this estimate of 10 to 255 is the range of values that were found for Ethiopia using an income transfer approach similar to how you might transfer a value of statistical life across settings if you're familiar with some of those um, approaches. So um, that is purely cross-sectional approach. Another way that we're doing now actually using some uh, panel data in several countries, uh, particularly Indonesia and South Africa, um, to look at what the opportunity cost threshold looks like using the UK type approach, which is uh, essentially finding some you know, quasi-experimental variation uh, in, in health expenditure and health and, and understanding what that um, what that buys you to give you the kind of efficiency parameter that you need. So essentially, um, that's all to say that I'm using the range from the income transfer approach, which are these, this, between these two lines. So it's cost effective only below the upper estimate of that. And these are the, uh, the one to three times GDP um, estimates, which were the traditional ones, which are ones that are mainly used in the literature even up to, up to today, um, which clearly shows you that the vaccine is uh, cost effective, a rotavirus vaccine. It's a very effective vaccine. And its uh, prices come down since uh, it was developed, so it's actually generally thought of as cost effective. Um, but we're saying if you believe that some of these lower estimates of the health opportunity cost, then you might be able to spend on things that are giving you an even better value um, uh, rather than the rotavirus vaccine. So now moving from the traditional cost effectiveness plane, and these are the different points given the different thresholds. So uh, you know, the ones that we're calling where the threshold was above the point, so it's showing that it's, it's, it was equitable and cost effective. Um, this is a change in the Atkinson score, um, pre and post uh, vaccine introduction. Um, and then, but in one setting, which is, or sorry, two settings, where it's above those two lines, we actually see that there's some sort of trade off approach. So good, we have a trade off. Okay, now we can start using our social welfare function. Um, uh, yeah, so. So this is what it looks like once you incorporate it into the Atkinson um, framework. So the same thing can be done with the Colm framework and other um, uh, functional forms of the social welfare function. Um, essentially, how do you read this graph? So given the different decision thresholds, um, this is now called um, equally distributed equivalent health. Um, so how much you value the health that's provided um, and the distribution that's provided given uh, versus how you would value it if it was equally distributed. Um, which is a bit of a um, difficult concept, but it, it, it comes eventually. Um, so anything here, because we're subtracting the vaccine program from the um, from the do nothing or the no vaccine program, anything that's below the line um, is coming from. Sorry, no, I told you wrong. This is the standard versus this kind of uh, more outreach-driven vaccine program. So anything that's negative, saying we're getting more value. Um, from that equity-driven vaccine program. So we accept, we're acceptors um, or investors in the program if it's below uh, the zero line there. And we're saying it's not um, something we accept in terms of the cost-effectiveness and equity um, uh, benefits to put together if it's above the line. And I mean, what we do since we'd say that, you know, really, it's hard to tell what your inequality aversion parameter is. Uh, we can, we've estimated it in the UK, is that the real one, who knows? Um, so the UK one, I think, was around 10, um, like we were saying. So what we just, we think that presenting things across a range of values and trying to communicate that well to policymakers in a transparent way is definitely uh, the way to go, rather than saying this is your value and, and, um, and this is what you should do. So we try to be very um, non-prescriptive. Um, so we're showing it here across these are the inequality aversion um, parameters. And you can see um, there was really just that um, one threshold to go back here of uh, 50 where it's falling close to the line. So then it really matters where our uh, inequality aversion parameter is because it might change what the investment decision is. 
Um, and some interesting things to find out where you know, there might be some levels of the decision threshold if we know what the actual level is, um, where there's actually no level of inequality aversion that causes us to be um, acceptors of that. Um, uh, of that. So that's just saying, you know, if that uh, threshold is very low, there's not actually a level of uh, inequality that we can achieve um, in terms of the level of inequality and the level of efficiency, or we would change the decision. So that was some interesting things, I guess, we're starting to come out of this when we're looking at um, an Ethiopian uh, setting. So um, I'll talk just quickly. I mean, the DCEA approach has not incorporated financial risk protection. Five minutes? Um, five minutes yeah. Okay. Has not incorporated financial risk protection, but um, we have a uh, handbook coming out from Oxford University Press. It's talking about, it's coming in supposedly in the 2019, where we're going through a lot of the DCEA approaches. Um, we do it in a way, it's, uh, the lead authors are, are Richard uh, Cookson, Tony Boyer, and Susan Griffin. Uh, so there's also Eric Schopgard, Nettie Vanderschleyer, um, myself, Stefan, Berger, a few others that are all doing some chapters. And we're laying out these approaches, trying to be very, I guess, piecemeal in a way. So if you're interested in your equ in equity impacts, um, if you're interested in, in costing and costing impacts, or if you're interested in the full package and you want to take the whole DCEA and run, run with it, then you can do this. But we do like, acknowledge that there's lots of data limitations and lots of uh, different ways of thinking about these uh, different concepts as well. So trying to be a bit more um, yeah, teaching in that approach. So, so uh, think about that. So in one area that we're doing is with um, uh, some others, we're thinking about the financial risk protection, um, which we, we consider that kind of a non-health benefit. Um, so um, and I say we think of it because I guess in Europe we're so obsessed with thinking of health benefits and opportunity costs. So we don't think too much about where the opportunity costs are in financial risk protection. But this is an example from the uh, textbook the, uh, chapter doing, and that's on uh, uh, based on an ECEA um, done by Nizreen Salty and, and Sipan in Lebanon looking at a tax intervention. So um, it's interesting because a lot of the ECEAs have been done around um, fiscal policy or changes in financing. Um, so some sort of cash transfer or voucher program, or uh, there's a, a quite a bit on, on tobacco taxes as well. And that's what's done here in uh, Lebanon. I mean, this is just the, the distribution like of the dashboard of health benefits, cases averted, not even looking at health, um, some sort of health outcome, but we're thinking in cases of uh, sorry, COPD, lung cancer, stroke, IHT, skin heart disease, hypertensive uh, heart disease, and bladder cancer, so kind of like the, the global burden of disease on the of tobacco related illness, uh, seeing that the poor are definitely benefiting more. Um, as everyone knows, there's a Maybe you should know there's high levels of smoking in Lebanon. I think it's one of the highest rates in the world amongst females. Um, I'm not sure anything else. But then also looking at the distribution of financial risk protection. This is just a change um, in a, an attack. So functioning through um, the price elasticity of demand through cigarettes, then functioning through reduced demand for cigarettes or some level of um, expensive margin through quitting. And then you see that the poor are benefiting the most. So uh, I mean, one feedback we've driven, we fed back to Stefan is that all of these examples seem to be very cost effective, uh, very equity improving, and very cost effective, uh, very um, financial risk protection improving. So we might be interested in looking at some other trade off um, and where um, interventions, where the decisions might not be so easy. But they are beneficial studies. Um, it's just that it's a bit hard to incorporate financial risk protection with the health. Um, so from, uh, from the York perspective, we would need the opportunity cost on consumption. Um, so, where does this leave us? And um, I will I'll wrap it up fairly uh, Yeah, okay. Um, is that the DCA approach can be used wherever um, the traditional cost effectiveness or uh, health technology assessments um, are done. Uh, they're quite uh, data intensive, and like I said, the really, I would say, uh, really good examples are so far done in the UK where quite a bit of uh, information, um, you know, histories of, of many health surveys and, and Population monitoring. Um, a lot of the Claxon and all work is, is really fascinating to read in terms of the level of detailed data that they have on health utilization and health expenditure. Um, and we also need new new parameters if we're building in this framework. Things such as distributions of opportunity costs. Uh, we need uh, ex discrete choice experiments or some sort of estimation of inequality aversion parameters in the population. We need to probably ask questions of who's 
inequality of urgent parameters matter population wide uh, policy makers some representative groups um, and um, and the last point I'll make is just related to the current work package um, that we have um, in our group around system level of interventions um, here thinking less on because I guess we've seen that there's been a large bit of cost effectiveness around incremental or marginal um, investments, uh, primarily in pharmaceuticals, um, but there's a large and growing literature um, around impact evaluation and uh, economic evaluation of system level. Um, some people call them system strengthening, some people call these population level interventions. I think the classification of these interventions is not clear yet, um, but just from the uh, uh, Institute for Development Studies, a uh, review of cost effectiveness of complex projects. So, what do we do with these big um, programs, and what do we? And then also um, from Manchester, Rachel Meacock has done some work on um, economic valuation of delivery platforms and, and broader level changes. So, these kind of non-marginal uh, changes, just to say that um, in our project, we're linking the impact evaluation of complex and system level interventions with the economic valuation. So, um, and one thing that's really kind of come out and I've been trying to push a bit is really building on these equity uh, components from the beginning, thinking that um, a lot of global programs that, that I'm familiar with at least are, you know, the Brazilian um, uh, program of Familia Salud, primary health care, community health workers, uh, improving quality of care in rural districts in South Africa is another area. So these are really, in a way, implicitly targeted programs or explicitly targeted programs that are improving the health system. So really strong um, I guess, ex ante objective in terms of equity. Um, so, you know, try to not leave it to the very end to think about equity and building it in uh, from the get go. And, and I think so, there's been some interesting ways of thinking about that. The opportunity cost is going to be, we're going to think about it a bit differently at a, at a broader system level rather than uh, at the margin. Uh, we think about costing differently. We also think about targeting efficiency um, of these programs. So, some other types of costs are essentially coming in. Um, into the program. So um, I will leave it there and let Bill. All right, thanks. Thanks, Bill Padula from uh, here at USC. And we'll be talking about Andrew's uh, presentation he just gave. Um, you know, I think uh, th there's a couple takes that I have as someone who does a lot of cost effectiveness analysis for research where um, it was an in, I, I reacted in an interesting way to his application of DCEA, for instance, because normally when when we do cost effectiveness analyses, we're thinking about cohorts and strictly looking at patients with colon cancer, patients with diabetes, and then developing an economic model around an intervention to treat those patients. So I I found this paper uh, by Cookson and the work that. Andrew and him and others have done together interesting because it was thinking um, it, on a much more broader level about the, the value of uh, healthcare and treat, uh, treating those who are uh, maybe more disadvantaged because when we do economic evaluation, we're breaking down into subgroups of a cohort looking at young versus elderly, male versus female, poor versus rich. So um, I saw this as a way of combining a, a large group together, and then uh, rather than doing a traditional subgroup analysis, this DCEA provides a, a, a nice, eloquent framework for uh, summated, summit, summarizing the added value of delivering health services in underprivileged patients. Um, one, one thing I was thinking about and looking about this figure that he presented on the uh, health equity impact plan. In a way, it's a bit of a moral compass in, in thinking about where do we allocate our resources. Uh, this plane is not fixed. You know, this origin is really adjustable depending on your willingness to pay threshold. So a country like the United States should be able to find a lot of excuses to develop uh, uh, health, public health interventions that are equitable because our willingness to pay threshold is high. To, like Andrew said, two to three times our, our GDP per capita. So in fact, the, where the bar sits at the cross in the middle, uh, we should be able to drop that down a lot and argue that a lot of public health interventions to make more healthcare more equitable for everybody um, is, a, is a cost effective and as he, as he puts it, a win-win or at least a win on the cost effectiveness side. Uh, there's some, some issues with quadrant two that I'll talk about in a second. So 
Um, what, what's exciting to see about this paper in general is that uh, obviously cost effectiveness analysis gets a bad rap when I hear it from the end of uh, being one who uses it. It's tied together with depth panels and just the idea of, uh, you know, with a, with a willingness to pay threshold of like $150,000 per quality, um, in a way it's allowing pharmaceutical companies to justify high prices on their drugs, you know, and, and I'll get to the fact that these expensive hepatitis C treatments, for instance, are under 150,000 per quality, and everybody's like, how am I going to afford an $80,000 drug for a 12-week course of treatment? So using this methodology gives us an opportunity to be a lot more equitable and find policy arguments that allow people access to these types of technologies who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it even with decent healthcare coverage. And I'll take you through three quick examples that I could uh, turn up on uh, this topic of hepatitis C and then going back to Andrew's uh, deep dive into vaccines and then thinking about another topic in medically necessary health coverage with the paper that I work on uh, as an application and cost effectiveness. Uh, the first was uh, the, this paper that a graduate student of mine, Teruja Karmarkar, did for her dissertation this past year looking at hepatitis C, where we found some really interesting information in her data. Uh, obviously, the, the treatments like Carboni and Sovaldi uh, range in price from $70,000 to $85,000 for a 12-week course of treatment. Um, and at that price, only about 25 to 30 percent of those diagnosed with hepatitis C are able to access the drug. Uh, so my, my question is, what is equitable? You know, millionaires and billionaires can obviously pull their wallet out and just pay for it in cash. Uh, those who are very well insured in this country can get access to the 12-week treatment at a, uh, it provided that they, they have a, an accurate diagnosis. But Medicaid patients are only being covered for high, when they have a very high fibrosis score, so they're very near to death, as one would put it. And, and clearly, that, that's not equitable, and uh, the DCEA framework um, pr provides some input, perhaps, to make, make a better argument that everybody can somehow get access and explore policy solutions to equal accessibility for different patients. Um, I pulled out this paper which really uses, uh, uses economic evaluation to look at the, the cost effectiveness burden of hepatitis C treatments, and it was written by some colleagues here at the USC Schaefer Center, uh, where, where they actually highlighted off this DCEA framework, a win-lose situation, something that is cost effective but not really affordable. Uh, it, when we look at the, the graphic over here, um, if you're treating all patients diagnosed with hepatitis C, here's the cost. It's not that bad relative to here's the health benefit. Okay. So if you, if you translate that into qualities, then uh, you, can, you can really get a lot of return on your investment. However, that little red capsule there, the cost for treating all those diagnosed, would clearly break a lot of budgets. Uh, and that's an issue that you know, I think, Andrew, just as a comment, something that can probably be added to this discussion in the future is going back to the talk about budget impact, especially in the context of high, high cost drugs that um, despite things being cost effective and equitable, we still have to find a way to pay for it. Uh, so something to think about there, um, because, you know, the, the expected net health benefit if you're only treating 30% is somewhere between, this is a 5% treat, treated scenario, so it's somewhere between here and here. So maybe it comes up to about there, and that's where the, the US is right now, but some say that's all we can really afford um, uh, based on current resources. So something to consider, I think. Um, you know, what, are, what are possible solutions? I'm just throwing things up on the chalkboard, but uh, you know, obviously treat everybody and break the budget. Uh, have a lottery for treatment, that seems equal, right? Equal opportunity for everybody. Um, but it's certainly not getting access to those who might really need the drug and, and will have no other alternatives. And then the third is something that uh, a lot of colleagues and I have been discussing is the idea of Medicaid expansion um, in order to, to cover those who can't afford it right now but have the disease. Um, and and that, that seems like an equitable approach because through Medicaid expansion, uh, perhaps um, taxpayer dollars could, could do more to pay for it. Uh, another example that I wanted to throw up on the board is 
is just looking at what, what Andrew referred to as the win-win in the DCEA framework, where you have something that is both cost-effective and, um, and equitable in terms of the health gains for all classes. So uh, there's this Clark paper looking at the uh, um, influenza type uh, B vaccine that was applied in India, and I'm sorry, it's, it's actually really slow, but these are all the different states in India, and simply just showing that you have this vaccine uh, to prevent a really complicated uh, acute condition that can lead to pneumonia um, and meningitis, and it's in, it, incredibly inexpensive. Um, so it, it makes it very cost effective and the fact is, is that the Indian government appears like it can afford to buy this for everybody who needs it in the country. So it's, ex it's inexpensive, it's cost effective, it's, it, we can deliver it equitably. But the issue with, uh, with India and a lot of developing countries is it's not easily accessible to everybody. The healthcare delivery infrastructure is not set up, set up to reach uh, those in out outlier states. And this applies clearly to a lot of places in Southeast Southeast Africa, Asia, Latin America. So I think something else that is, that is an important domain to consider of this DCEA framework that isn't explicit is the logistics of delivery and the accessibility of these issues that still limit access even when it's a win-win. And then finally, uh, I thought I'd share a, a paper that I did looking at um, the healthcare coverage of costs of, for the transgender population in the United States. And this was an interesting win-win scenario too, where um, you know obviously it's a very politicized topic in something like the Trump administration, where uh, there's the question of whether or not um, transgender individuals can be covered through Medicaid, or uh, you hear it with the military health health policies, or in, in prison settings where um, they just say it's too expensive. But when you actually look at the cost effectiveness of what it costs to support the medically necessary care for people who are transgender, which can include um, you know, st the, the primary care as well as the transitional care for people who are transgender, transgender it's, it's extremely cost effective at US willingness to pay thresholds and it has a really low budget impact. Actually, it's the same budget impact as treating uh, all kids with cystic fibrosis in the country. And we, we, we choose to do that as a country. So why is it that we choose to pay for one condition and we have another harmful condition that uh, it, it, we're not paying for? So the answer is that you know, it's the win-win, it's cost-effective, it's low-budget impact, so it's, it's easy to be equitable with transgender health care, but it's simply a politicized topic. And so that's another domain maybe that is missed out on this DCA framework to talk about a little bit is that a lot of these concepts, even though they're good value, uh, they're still held off the, off the table until um, they can bargain for what they want, want in other uh, areas politically, so something to consider there. Um, so, so to sum up in the discussion, I thought that uh, this DCEA framework was really valuable. Uh, it, it helps us think about cost-effectiveness models and other lights than the traditional cohort model. And, uh, and, and it, and brings to light, um, you know, some some of these issues that we constantly think about. And I think, uh, in in balance with the discussion of cost effectiveness and equity, if you bring all of these other pieces to the table, and you can develop a good argument for the adoption of public health interventions that lead to better health equity. So I'll leave it at that. Questions for Andrew? Can I respond to Bill's points really quick? Because yeah. so I think they're very good. And I think some of them are things I think we try to think about and build into the frameworks, and some of them are not. So for instance, uh, the issue in India, actually what you're talking about, vaccine delivery systems, is probably something that I would say is a system level intervention. So something that is a health infrastructure investment that then provides some platform for delivery where you then have shared costs um, for improvement across multiple intervention packages. And that, so that is one area that we're trying to push on the system level intervention is looking at um, the platforms of delivery. So we build it in through the shared costs or the increase in you know, delivery outcomes from a single, so essentially cross, cross service uh, implementation. Uh, <coughs> so it's just really kind of looking at these cross elasticities of implementation in a way. Um, I, I think it's it's always fascinating because I mean the UK is such a convenient setting when you've relaxed the 
uh, essentially, well, you've simplified the budget constraint uh, scenario and you've relaxed the political constraint because it's already set and policy has something to do. So that, I mean, to, to think about these things as constraints that can either be relaxed or you know, like, uh, simplified is a, is a kind of the way that we try to try to think about it. So it's nice to see like uh, in a US city where uh, the budget or the resources and you might have to do something like budget impact because you have multiple budgets and multiple sources of expenditure um, certainly adds complexity that sometimes makes that, I think the cost effectiveness issue or problem intractable or needing more sophisticated methods and, and computation uh, sometimes. Also on the political constraints, sometimes I think we try to be very clear that cost effectiveness is not always the right tool for everything. Uh, I think the economic evidence you show in transgender communities probably is, is amazing, but we we also try to, you know, we try to not try to sound like we're pushing cost effectiveness as a, as a tool for everything. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's just another to consider, so thanks. Can I have a clarification? So how are you using the inequality aversion parameter value in cost effectiveness? Are you, are you weighting different parts yeah. differently? Yeah, so that is the inequality aversion parameter essentially gives you the shape of the social welfare function, which then weights the distribution of health that you have. So it's exactly a weighting term that you but have. You, so you, you could, But you're weighting the threshold or the qualities? You're weighting the, you're weighting the qualities. You're weighting the you're qualities, weighting the qualities that, of a new intervention that you're evaluating. Yes. But so you have to know exactly, like for a diabetes intervention, what fraction of those qualities would accrue to poor people versus rich people. Yes, exactly. Is that feasible? Um, well, in I mean, we do it in a modeling framework, right? So yeah. we have um, a disease model. You have the effectiveness of a you know, vaccine can be, for instance, yeah, so I think in vaccines, okay, we can think about a diabetes intervention. Some parameters might be stable across socioeconomic groups. Some might be incurring some different costs at different levels or have different levels of coverage and access. Um, that then determine those downstream health outcomes. So yeah, so we do. So I mean, the, even the if the parameters doesn't change, you still have to have some sense of the prevalence of your target population, where some people would be poorer and some people would be richer who would get that intervention. Yeah. And basically, you you would use it to kind of up upweight yeah. the health of the so poor. So we, we do. I mean, in the baseline, we do characterize the health burden by the. Mm -hmm. social disadvantage or, or social group that are interested okay. in. Um, it's much more possible. I mean, so for instance, you can get uh, like DHS surveys have quite a bit of information mm -hmm. on wealth quintiles and um, prevalence of certain health conditions or right. certain utilization. But it is, I mean, the data, prob I mean, there are big data issues. Right. And right. the more you add to this framework, the more data issues you're going to. So, so can I have a follow up on that? Yeah. So if you do that, if that's, the, if that's your social welfare function, right? wouldn't your threshold be different? Because when you're displacing health, you know, there, some health will be displaced from poorer people and some health will be displaced from richer people. And so you, you have to weigh them differently. Yeah, so we do that through what I was showing, where they've done that distribution in the UK to show where the threshold does differ. But you're saying there might be some other... So, I mean, you're still using one like single threshold to do the cost effectiveness analysis, right? But if you do the equity weights, you would yeah. upweight the qualities of the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. Yeah. But then you compare the new ICER to the same threshold? No, we compare it to the to the threshold for that specific group, which does present some problems in terms of thinking about those as independent mm -hmm. groups. Um, so no, so we do do a specific threshold for mm -hmm. each group. Okay, we can maybe talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, see the, I see the problem yeah. in a way because you're, I mean, because it's functioning in a system also, you're kind yeah. of changing yeah. one thing that knocks yeah. everything else out. out. Yeah. yeah. To piggyback on that, would, would that imply that the best policy is to give something to some groups but not others based on their income? If one is well, cost, it's cost effective for some groups but not others taking equity into account? Sure, yeah. I, 
I mean, I, at least I find that there's a lot of these kind of questions. There are some natural questions that come in terms of, you know, what point do you start investing in a mix of things? And I think what we try to say, so certainly if you said that there was, if you were maximum in your preferences or society was maximum in their preferences, you'd give all the money to the worst off. And that's clearly not the reality of the situation, which is why we've kind of focused on the Atkinson kind of it's called like weighted prioritarianism. So some sort of weight towards the poor, but not full weight. Um, because you could end up in a, a, a health, a, I would call it like a perverse health in, um, problem where you're then mm -hmm. investing so much that you're actually leveling down or reducing health by, by a lot in the population. So I think that's where it starts to get from the kind of, yeah, the hypothetical what could be done towards the, the reality. Um, yeah. I could ask another, sure. or no, go ahead. I was just sort of wondering if you could get in the head of the people doing your ch discrete choice experiment. I was surprised that 84% um, were interested in some sort of equity adjustment and only 2% were interested in, in ma maximizing health. And so I was trying to wonder what it, what it is they're thinking. And I, I guess it's that they're not worrying quite so much about people's health um, because they're not interested in maximizing that. Is it that they feel, this is just your guess of what they're thinking, are they thinking that because poor people are disadvantaged in other ways, we'd like to do something extra to augment their health? How, why is it, they're th why do you think they're, they're like this? Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Because, well, one thing, I didn't grow up in the UK, so understanding social uh, issues in the UK is fairly, fairly new to me, uh, starting to get my head around it. Um, a bit more. Uh, it's. It, I think it absolutely depends on how you're showing that information. So I, yeah. I wish I'd find now put up a slide about it, but to show how we present that information in terms of these kind of bars of health, like this person gains this many units of health or this many life years from an intervention, and this person gains this many, and they're in these different uh, uh, social groups in terms of their income level. Um, so we, yeah, I, I think people... I think it's coming from some sort of level of national solidarity, probably, yeah. and thinking about you know that society should be um, distributing or you know maybe because it, it does it depends on um, I mean, it's pretty consistent whether or not the people were poor or rich themselves um, and how they identify with with those different groups because I think that's going to change things as well. It's going mean, to depend mm, on how you yeah. show them everything. It's I a, mean, if you're interested in this in and of itself. It would seem like doing that sort of experiment in different countries with different yep. levels of solidarity would be really interesting. I wouldn't, because I, I don't think I would expect such a uh, stark distribution in the United States, for example. Yeah, I, no. I don't know. That would be interesting. I think there's a lot more work on this that yeah. could be done. Yeah, even Larry, in the UK. Larry Bobo has done some work at Harvard around sort of how okay. people think about whether or not uh, benefits should be given to African Americans. Mm -hmm. And of course, people. What's the name? Larry, Larry Bobo. Oh, Larry Bobo. And what was his, his findings? That people were less likely to support programs that were going to African Americans. Oh, programs, programs going to. Yeah. But, but, but is the is the equity part here? If the framework he showed is the idea is to have egalitarian distribution of health, right? And you want to, you know, channel resources towards those who have less health to move them up, right? Yeah. So. To some extent, this equity rate should be across health distribution and not anything else, right? People who have lower, or higher sh poly shortfall should be getting higher weights, That's right? But by using socioeconomic status, you know, you are bringing in a lot more mm. in that social welfare function, which is not health, which is not just health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, that's a, a, that's a very good point. Yeah, we kind of take, I think that is problem, I think it's even worse than global wealth, where you're trying to take the wealth quintile as a mutually independent, stable group mm. um, that's also just something in and of itself, like you're saying, not, not a simple parameter that this also has all these mm -hmm. easy properties to it. So, yeah, no, those are yeah. really good feedback. And I, I do think the the, dis, the choice experiments that do this, uh, you know, they've only done run a few, but I know there's kind of a bigger scale up of that work to look more at it in the UK. Be nice to look at some of the US. Related to your comment, I was wondering within the framework, how do we address that 
using qualities enforces a dimension of uh, inequality in that interventions that prolong life for people who are able-bodied will be valued more than interventions that uh, prolong life for people who are disabled and won't return to able status. That is a, that is within the general quality uh, and Dolly criticism, and um, yeah. So I, that's I, I think that's a great question. I think it's a bit um, hard for me to answer without being we have, it's we have, we have more, more of a study on quality. Yeah, yeah. I mean <laughs> yeah. it's around yes. concept people that are you know are, are um, hearing impaired or mm -hmm. blind don't identify always as having a disability. Whereas, you know, we asked a person that's not blind, if they became blind, how much they rate that disability. Yeah. So I think, um, so that, that I think is a, a big issue within the whole health metric right. uh, literature as well to think about. But, but that issue has been blown out of proportion a lot because, you know, at least the recent <coughs> reviews, none of the evaluation was, had that problem because they didn't review anything for, you know, especially for disabled yeah. patients. Um, and yet, when the CVS came out with the threshold, which obviously is a weird thing to do, a lot of the backlash was based on that that comment. Uh, but it was never used mm -hmm. in yeah. the evaluation. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not. So I, I know it's it's a um, limitation that I don't know if it advances in this area. But is what if you were to weigh the change in health due to uh, in relation to the the sample population's current state, like if those weights versus a healthy life year, but it's, you value Well, you know, the, there are a lot of recommendations in the literature. Eric Nord has put forth a recommendation how to solve this. You know, uh, Magnus Johansson has, has other recommendations. But these are all ad hoc fixes to a, to a infrastructure that is like more theory based. So anything that needs to be changed needs to be driven more kind of from theory and mm -hmm. says like, what. You know why why we are changing it and what mm -hmm. what implications it would have. But if you, you will find a lot of ad hoc recommendations about how to change this. I mean, the other point that brings up to me is also I mean like Bill's point. I'm thinking of transgender community. So very small, vulnerable communities, small relatively to the general population in terms of numbers. Um, I mean that those are their big equity questions there, and how do you address that? It might not. So far, I wouldn't say this is the right tool because this is looking more at this kind of population level distribution. So far, yeah, we use the socioeconomic status as some sort of uh, stratifier, but I mean, to really start weighting any disability group or, or other types of disadvantaged groups, I think, you start to think maybe think about other tools or other ways of building maybe new frameworks or new ways of thinking. Because I, I, I agree, I think you could start, there's clearly a lot of injustice and questions of fairness and, once you start breaking down to smaller groups, that's hard to. Okay, well, um, that's all for the presentations. We have lunch outside, and that's the end of the conference. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.